Welcome to the Security Speakeasy Show, where we talk about all things network security. Today, we're discussing highly evasive malware, what it is, how it works, and how you can protect your organization from these types of attacks. My name is Melody Nori, and I'm a product marketing manager here at Palo Alto Networks. Today, I'm joined by my colleague and industry expert, Bob Jung. Bob, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Bob Young, and I'm a researcher who's focused most of my career in the past 20 years on manual and automated program analysis. So I have a lot of background in things like reverse engineering, virtualization, and machine learning. And for the past five years or so, I've been managing the Malware and Countermeasures Unit here at Palo Alto Networks. It's a globally distributed team of researchers that all pitch in to help deal with the, the never-ending stream of malware classification issues that crop up from analyzing literally billions of files that our systems handle each month. Thanks, Bob. We're so excited to have you here with us today, and it seems like you have some great experience in this space. So why don't we go ahead and jump into what exactly highly evasive malware is? Excellent question. So at a high level, when we say highly evasive malware, we're talking about malware that's done a really good job of avoiding detection by all the existing traditional analysis techniques. Uh, let's take a second to think about the 10,000 foot view of malware analysis. The truth is that there's no single approach that works perfectly to detect all malware. If there was, our entire industry would have standardized already on just using that. Uh, in practice, what we have is a whole lot of different approaches, different types of signatures like Yara, uh, Impash, SSD, and a whole bunch of others. Essentially, uh, you know, static analysis, we're, we're looking at specific patterns in the bytes that make up the file we're analyzing. We also have sandboxing and other dynamic analysis approaches where we're looking at the, the way where we're watching a program execute and monitoring it really closely to see what happens. I always like to use the analogy of tossing some bacteria into a petri dish to see how it starts to grow. But we're, we're really what we're doing is we're looking for suspicious behaviors uh, while it executes. There's also machine learning that's really commonly used with static and dynamic analysis. There's antivirus that will you know, typically emulate instructions inside executables to detect malicious patterns. Um, different kinds of file parsing techniques and file, you know, for all the different file types out there. And there's just tons and tons of approaches out there. So backing up, we have dozens of these different approaches that form the current state of practice across uh, the, the whole industry. And so what I think we can do is sort of broadly take all of these and put them into two categories, static analysis and dynamic analysis. And we're talking about highly evasive malware. We're talking about malware that has really effectively countered everything in both buckets. So we're talking about statically armored payloads, making it harder and possible to create signatures, as well as dynamic evasions preventing behavioral detection. I see. Could you dive a bit deeper into how a highly evasive malware manages to evade detection by some of our traditional security measures? So in the past, there's been times when my team felt stuck. Every now and then there would be a situation where the malware author really did their homework and made detection a chore for us. So you know, if they decoded, encrypted, or otherwise obfuscated the payload inside the file, we can't make any signatures like a YAR rule or anything else to detect it by just looking at the bytes. Uh, you know, next we'd you know then take a look at you know are there any opportunities for behavioral detection? For example, is there any kind of suspicious looking API calls or a file path that stands out or network activity? Basically, just looking to see if there's any anything unique to the malware that we're analyzing. However, here's the crux: the problem is that sometimes malware will know that it's running in a sandbox and choose not to execute. It might determine it's running in a known VM or the environment just doesn't look like the system it should be targeting. We actually recently wrote a blog post about how there's almost an infinite number of ways you can figure out if you're currently executing in a malware sandbox. We've just seen about everything you can imagine. Uh, so so there's, the, there's the rub. Since we're analyzing every file on our customer networks, we can't exactly call anything that looks like it might have encoded data as malware. Or we'd have a lot of FPs. We'd be in big trouble with a lot of upset customers. Right, right. That makes sense. It seems like these modern types of evasive malware have a lot of tricks up their sleeve. Um, do you have any top of mind examples of attacks that have used evasion techniques like this? I wouldn't say there's any one single family that stands out as there's a lot of threat, threat actors moving in this direction. I mean, all malware authors are incentivized to make it life harder for the detection side. And we've been seeing more evidence of this in recent years. I think a big pattern in the, in the set of what we might call highly evasive is when we see malware authors le leveraging components from the various red teaming tools out there. These are frameworks that were designed specifically to help red teams get around the industry standard detection techniques. For example, you know, we, we see a lot of authors reusing parts of Cobalt Strike and Meterpreter. I imagine it's really convenient for them not to have to, you know, write their own shellcode loaders or command and control protocols and all, this, and all the other stuff that these frameworks provide. So I think it's been a, a theme where we've been seeing a lot of solid detections with some of our newer advanced detection techniques 
for all these types of things where the traditional approaches haven't been working. Right. So you mentioned new advanced detection techniques. It seems like that might be the path for organizations to try and address some of these sophisticated threats. Uh, can you share a bit more about how organizations can protect themselves? Uh, for, first off, I think there's the broader answer that's a little sort of outside the scope of talking about just malware detection. Every organization is going to be doing themselves a big favor with defense and depth strategies, including EDR, zero trust, you know, all that good stuff. These things are always going to be raise the bar against any type of threat, whether or not it's, you know, highly evasive. Um, but, you know, switching gears back to the, you know, talking about specifically malware analysis and detection. Um, one of the main points I think that's worth making is that as practitioners, we always love to hear numbers and statistics around detection efficacy and how well our systems are doing. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to the fact that a single payload can really ruin your day. So if you have nice statistics, like we detect 99% of everything, uh, but it's going to be that last really irritating 1% that's going to, you know, that, that we considered that was too hard to detect. That's, that's, you know, means our, our day can still be ruined. Um, you know, so that being said, I, I think there's absolutely value in all the previously mentioned traditional techniques I talked about at the start of our conversation, like static SIGs and traditional sandboxing. Um, you know, I, I would never for a second advocate any practitioner to write them off as worthless. Malware detection is really, you know, it's like the art of fusing together different analysis approaches. As, as we showed in Wildfire, it's not about like any one uh, specific approach. It's about weaving together dozens of approaches to maximize the amount of malware we detect while also minimizing the amount of false positives. So given that malware authors are aware of the industry standard practice and actively testing their wares against all the traditional techniques we're using, there's this need to go above and beyond what we're currently doing. And so, you know, uh, my, my team set out and we kind of did what we do best, you know, years ago. And we, we, we noodled over a, a new way to look at the problem and how we could really easily go after all these highly evasive, uh, you know, malware samples at scale. And what we found is that the, the key to this, in our experience, is looking really closely at the changes in process memory during execution. Uh, it really told an interesting story and produced a lot of signal that we could use for manual signatures and machine learning classifiers. So the beauty of looking at memory during execution is that it really doesn't matter if the payload does anything. By definition, in order to determine that the, they are not going to execute, the malware needs to unmask some code. In order to figure out that you're not going to detonate that payload, you need to have at least some code execute. And if you're going to execute that initial evasion code, then you need to have it loaded in memory. And if you're loaded in memory, then we, we got them, you know. So I think the main challenge for us with all this was to make it fast enough to work at scale. And there were some engineering challenges, but um, you know, with, with the, the massive uh, massive numbers of files that we deal with every day, uh, it took some effort, but we were able to work with our custom hypervisor team and, and we were able to figure out ways of making memory analysis extremely fast that so we can now use it at scale uh, in advanced wildfire. Great. Well, thanks so much, Bob, for sharing your insights and joining us today at Security Speakeasy to talk about highly evasive malware and how organizations can protect themselves against these attacks. If you like today's episode, hit the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment below. To learn more about Advanced Wildfire, visit paloaltonetworks.com. And thanks so much for tuning in. See you in the next episode.